Now we begin looking at subtraction. Okay? Now if you think about subtraction, one of the things that we do is we kind of remind ourselves of how binary subtraction works. Okay? Just like we did with addition. But let's think about this. Let's put all the possible codes out there and let's just see what happens when we look at the difference between two numbers. So if I say 0 minus 0, what would you say? It's zero. If I said, let me jump over here, 1 minus 0, what would you get? You get 1. What if you said 1 minus 0, that you'd say that's the same as that thing. What if I said 1 minus 1? 0. Now let's go back to this guy and go 0 minus 1. This is the hard case. What is its number? Yeah, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? <clears throat> it's you have to do this thing called a borrow. Okay, now you probably don't remember borrow. It's probably been a while since you've done any subtraction by hand. But let's go and let's just remind ourselves, if I did something like 13 and decimal minus 7, <laughs> that's a horrible, horrible example. Let's do 92 minus 14. This is decimal numbers. <clears throat> I start at the lowest value position, and I perform subtraction. 2 minus 4, I'm out of business. I can't do it. So what I have to do is I have to do what's called a borrow from a higher order position. So I take one of these away. That thing that I took away is then added to this guy right here. But here's the critical piece you got to remember. It's not added as if it's in this position, this, this position I'm doing it still has the weight of its current position. So it's added over here as a 10. Okay? That's how much it brings over. So what I do is I borrow, and this whole thing right here actually becomes 12. Okay? Now, it's very simple. We do that automatically without even thinking about it, but it becomes important when you look at binary. If I say 12 minus 4, that gives me what? 8. Then I come over here and I go 8 minus 1. That's easy to do. 78. Let us now apply that to binary. First of all, you go, what, what am I going to borrow here from? <laughs> well, you just assume you have something there because you will. You're going to have a circuit that you will say, if I need to borrow, track it. Make sure you keep track that I just borrow. So I'm going to borrow over here from something, a higher order bit. And then what I bring over to here is 1, 0. Okay? I don't change this to 1 and say 1 minus 1 is a 0. What I say is I have 1, 0 plus a 0. That's equal to 1, 0. So now I say 1, 0 minus 1. What is that answer? It's like, oh, I can't remember. Let's flip them over to decimal. What is 1, 0 in decimal? It's 2, right? Well, 2 minus 1 is what? It's 1. So this answer right here is actually 1. That right here is what we call the difference. Okay? These numbers are the differences. However, look at what happened. We had a borrow in this situation, so we do what we call a borrow. Okay. So the answer ended up being 0, 1, 1, 0, and this situation right here had a borrow. How's that feel? All right, life is good. You want to know something that's pretty amazing about that? <clears throat> if I wrote this in a truth table form, you know what I'd get? An exclusive OR gate. A, B, and difference. And in fact, this now motivates for the way that we actually do subtraction in the real world. We want to reuse our addition circuit. We can use those exclusive OR gates that we built in our full adders to actually perform subtraction. And it's all motivated by the fact that the difference will equal the sum. Okay? Now, as soon as you start doing subtraction, you immediately run into negative numbers. There's no way around it. When you add two positive numbers, you always get a positive result. If you subtract positive numbers, half the time you're going to get a negative number. So you immediately have to just say, I give up. I'm going to use negative numbers. So subtraction immediately starts using signed numbers. The signed code that we use is twos comp. If you recall, how you perform twos comp is you can take a number 
and you can find its two's complement, which would be its equivalent negative code by flipping all the bits and adding one. Okay? So for example, if I said seven, let's do four bits. Everything is going to be four bit. Okay? If I said seven in a four bit unsigned code, or even two's complement code, it'd be zero, one, one, one. If I said, well, how would I get to negative seven? What I would do is I would step one, complement all the bits. So I'd go one, zero, zero, zero. And then step two is I add one to it. And what I end up getting is one, zero, zero, one. This now is negative seven. How's that feel? Pretty interesting, okay? We want to remember that flip the bits and add one. That's how we're going to accomplish two's complement, okay? Feel good? Okay, I come up to you and I say the following. If I took A subtract B and I got the difference, is that the same as A plus negative B? The answer is yes. It is absolutely correct. Those are the equivalent to each other. This means what I want to do is I want to take my adder circuit and I want to use it to perform subtraction by performing two's complement on the input B and then I just say, bah, go. Oh, it's almost too easy. Okay? So all I really need to do <clears throat> is this. All I am going to do here is come along and say, guess what? I just take B and I put an inversion on it and then I need to add one to it. Guess what was so fortunate that we use a full adder in our zeroth position? We have the ability to bring in either a zero or a one. When we use an adder, we bring it in as a zero. But guess what? If I invert B and then put a one right that, that is identical to performing the two's complement of it. I have inverted B, I flipped all the bits, and I added one to it, and that then gives me the ability to use my adder as a subtractor. Okay? It turns out that logically, the carry will produce the exact value as a borrow when you do this. All we have to do is put an inversion right here on B, change that to a one, and I have the difference and I get a borrow out and it's all for free. How cool is that? Now, you're going, whoa, whoa, this is pretty awesome here, but let's slow her down a little bit. Pump the brakes. You're just throwing inverters around like it's nobody's business, right? Well, where are these inverters coming from? And now you're taking a zero and a one. It's like you got to be able to do something a little more eloquent than saying, well, yeah, you got an inverter and now you don't have an inverter and it was a zero and it's a one. Let's, let's come up with a way to automatic, not automatically, but to more dynamically do this. Let's make it as simple as possible. I propose to you a programmable inverter. <clears throat> okay? I would like something that if I give it a control signal such as a zero, okay, you just pass the value through. Okay? So I would like something that when you have the, imp the control signal is equal to a zero, you are going to be a buffer. Okay? When the control signal is a one, I want you to be an inverter. How's that feel? All right, well, that's kind of neat. Let's try to put this in uh, truth table form. Okay? So I'm going to have a truth table. I'm going to have my input right here. Okay, that's my input. And this is the same input. And then this will be my output. We'll call it F, just because we're a truth table. And I'm going to list here the two situations for control. Okay? So it's going to be, uh, I got a zero and a zero. This is going to be control. Okay? And then for the input under those situations, it can either take on a zero and a one. And when I'm at zero and a one, I want to just pass it through. I'm this guy right here. Okay? So I'm a buffer. Now let's take the situation where the control is a one. And I have the same code, 0 and 1 for the input. In this situation, I'm going to go 1, 0. So now this represents the inverter. There's my truth table. Does anybody recognize that? 
That's an exclusive OR gate, okay? Holy cow, an exclusive OR gate is a programmable inverter. All you do is you take one of its inputs and it serves as the control, and you take the other input and it's actually the input that you care about. Now this is amazing. You know, and it's amazing for a couple different reasons, okay? The first thing is this. The first thing is, if I redrew this subtractor, okay, I am going to basically say, all I gotta do is put an exclusive OR gate in front of B. So I have four exclusive OR gates, and I run B, B0, 1, 2, and 3, into one of the inputs. Then I have a control signal that tells those exclusive OR gates whether or not to invert. The reason that that's so powerful is because this control signal then dictates whether this is an adder or a subtractor. Think about this. If this control signal is a zero, what do these inverters do? These exclusive OR gate programmable inverters. They don't invert. They simply pass B. That's a really good thing because this would be a situation where you are now going to add. But remember the only other thing we had to keep track of is that if we're going to bring in on this first carry in, if I'm adding, this zero needs to also go right down there. That's pretty sweet. I can have one signal that tells all of the exclusive OR gates to not invert, just pass B, and I can use that same control signal as the input into the first carry in. Let's think about this. What happens if I come along and I say, now I would like to, instead of doing that, we'll do a one here. That signifies that I would like to subtract. I put a one on these control inputs of the exclusive OR gates that will invert B, piece of cake. Guess what else? If I take that same logic, I can route it down into here, and that will then produce the one completing the two's complement of the input B. I have now inverted B and added one. You have it. So what we do is I've created the name right here, add, and then I put lowercase n for add negative logic. So that means a zero means add, and a, well, here it is right there. And a one, I'm not still gonna do that. And a one means subtract. How amazing is that? Look at how simple that is. That is all you have to do, and that is absolutely what they do in computers. You don't build a 32-bit adder and then go, oh, I'm gonna perform subtraction. Go over and build a 32-bit subtractor separately from it. You say, absolutely not. I'm going to use the same circuit. I'll just augment it with some of these exclusive OR gates and programmably tell it to be a subtractor. How cool is that? There is one little thing that we must keep in mind whenever we use two's complement numbers. Two's complement numbers have the ability to overflow. That is always our concern. Two's complement overflow. We typically overflow, we give it the symbol V, okay, for overflow. I don't know why it's V. It is V. That means you have a problem. You got yourself a situation. <clears throat> what is two's complement overflow? It's where the result doesn't fit within the range of bits that you have. Here is the classic example. Not classic, but here's the example, okay? You have a four-bit two's complement number, and you want to know what are the maximum and minimum values that this can take on. Well, the highest positive value that this could take on is going to be 0, 1, 1, 1, and that's going to be equal to positive 7. The most negative number you can take on is 1, 0, 0, 0, which is negative 8. And these things will then increment like this all the way up to 0, 0, 0, 0, and at this point, that's where they flip over and become positive. So up here, you have essentially eight positive codes. Down here, you have eight negative codes, okay? The issue is that these ads work just fine, except that you have a lot of situations where the result can't fit within there. So I've got a two, I've got a four bit number. It can take on codes between negative eight to positive seven. You immediately go, where'd you come up with that? If you recall, the range of a two's complement number is given by this equation, which goes from negative two to the n minus one up to two to the n minus one minus one. So for our example, n is four, we're using four bits, so we go from a negative two to the three up to two to 
2 to the 3 minus 1. So that means negative 8 decimal up to positive 7 decimal. So any results that we have due to the result of an addition or a subtraction using two's complement numbers have to fit within this range. Now it's absolutely possible that you can have a result that should should be accurate but lie outside of this range. So look at this example. 7 plus 7. Okay? 7 can be represented with a 4-bit two's complement code accurately. 0, 1, 1, 1. So, but when you add 7 to 7, the answer is 14 decimal. <clears throat> but 14 does not fit within a 4-bit two's complement code. So this becomes the big issue that you have to keep track of when you do two's complement arithmetic. So what we do is we have to track what is called two's complement overflow. And we give it the variable v, and so this is for overflow. And all computer systems or digital systems that use two's complement arithmetic have to have a separate circuit that tracks the v. So in this situation, we'd say that v is equal to a 1 because you had two's complement overflow. And that just means that the result, either of an addition or a subtraction, fell outside of the range of possible values that this n-bit two's complement code could take on. Okay, but what's kind of neat about this is that you can actually narrow down the situations that would result in two's complement overflow. So for example, when you are adding, <clears throat> if you have a positive plus a positive and the result was a negative, you have two's complement overflow. Okay? Or if you have negative plus negative and the result was a positive, you have two's complement overflow. So in our example, let's take a look at what that looks like when we look at the actual binary code. So 7 in 2's complement is 0, 1, 1, 1. So if I added 0, 1, 1, 1 to 0, 1, 1, 1, I'm going to get 0 with the carry, 1 plus, 1 plus 1 is 1 with the carry, 1 with the carry, 1. <clears throat> Notice that that is considered a negative number because the sign bit of the 2's complement code is a 1. So this tells us immediately you had a positive plus a positive by looking at the most significant bits of the inputs, and you had a negative on the sum because the most significant bit of the sum was a 1. Now, you don't even need to know what the actual value of the result was. All you need to know is, is the sign bits of the inputs and the output. Now, <clears throat> if you come back to this, look at this situation that we had. We had a most significant bit was a 0 during an add to a most significant bit of a 0, and the result had a sum with the most significant bit as a 1. So all we needed to do was build a circuit which would track that. It's very logical. It's very combinational logic uh, truth table. Uh, so you could also have a situation where you did a negative plus a negative, or a most significant bit of a 1, most significant bit of a 1 added together, and the sum had a most significant bit of a 0. Same thing with subtraction. If you did a negative minus a positive, and that equaled a positive, or a positive minus a negative, and you got a negative, you would have two's complement overflow. This is a separate circuit that has to exist, separate from your arithmetic circuit, that is just going to sit and wait for the result, and then track whether you had two's complement overflow. If you have two's complement overflow, what it tells you is that your system produced a result that is inaccurate, and you have to take some sort of action because of it.